Well, good morning. Great to, uh, to be here with you. I love coming to Scotland. I almost studied at Bible College in Scotland, and when I say almost, it was Berwick upon Tweed. <laughs> Uh, it's, the only it's the only English town that has a football team in the Scottish League. It's that close to Scotland. But um, I always thought that we had a beautiful view from the Bible College grounds over the River Tweed until I stood and looked out the window here. I think you've probably got a, you've got a more impressive view. First time I brought my wife here, oh, nearly uh, 25 years ago, when we first got married, my wife is originally from Uzbekistan, so English is not her first language. And uh, she was quite concerned coming up here because she'd heard about the Scottish accent. And some of you who are not from Scotland studying up here, you might have had similar concerns. And she said, how am I going to understand anybody? I said, well, if you understand my dad, who's from Northern Ireland, you're going to be able to understand Scottish people. It's not, it's not that difficult. And we walked up Princess Street and she said, Richard, I don't understand a word, anything anybody's saying. I said, don't worry, that's the Italian rugby fans are here. <laughs> Now, I'm from Yorkshire, from the nation state of Yorkshire, uh, so you might have a little bit of problem understanding some of, uh, some of my accent, if you, if you do. Um, put your hand up if I'm speaking too quickly, and I'll try and, and, try and slow down to you. So, this morning, I'd like to uh, talk to you about biblical and theological principles that will help motivate us in taking the message of Jesus to Jewish people. Now, the rebirth of interest in and prayer for Jewish mission that birthed CWI, or as it was called 177 years ago, the British Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Jews, which then got shortened to BGS, the British Jew Society. And then when we started to have missionaries outside of Britain, we became the IJS. You can guess what the I stands for? International. So long Victorian titles, the International Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Jews. And our start owes a great deal to the men and women of God from Scotland who helped found what is today CWI. It was the very famous Robert Murray McShane, and you should all know who he is by now, who opened our founding meeting in prayer. And uh, the Reverend Ridley Herschel, who himself was a Jewish believer, who drove our founding uh, and held uh, the initial opening meeting at the National Scotch Church Regent Square in London on the 7th of November 1842. And latterly, Ridley Herschel also was a driving force in founding the Evangelical Alliance as well. But it could be argued that their faithfulness and their prayer is what God is honouring today in the increased numbers of Jewish people that are naming the name of Jesus as their Messiah and their Lord. Certainly, prior generations' prayerful intercession for the salvation of the Jewish people is not currently matched uh, by our contemporary missionary interest and commitment in the wider church. That is, that, is, that is a sad reality. But what I want to think about this morning is, what was it that motivated their missional engagement with the Jewish people? In 1942, Frank Exley, who was a, 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 a CEO of uh, CWI, wrote a book on the early history of CWI, called it Our Heart's Desire. And he said this, The closing decade of the 18th century and the early years of the 19th witnessed a remarkable manifestation of concern for the evangelization of the world. The period was one of great unrest. Napoleon had dreamed of world conquest and plunged Europe into war, but a nobler vision had fired the imagination of servants of Christ in our land. They dreamed of a world won for him, and the troubles of the time did not prevent them from striving to make their dream come true. In this new enthusiasm for the proclamation of the gospel, the need of the Jewish people was not forgotten. Thus the society came into being, launched largely upon the tide of Scottish enthusiasm for Jewish evangelism. Now I'd like to think about what that nobler vision was. What was that nobler vision that helped our forebears in prayer and intercession, whose prayers and tears laid the foundation for the work that we have today? What was, what was it that gave them a vision that saw beyond the problems and the trauma and the anxiety of a, a changing and troubled world? Arguably, we could say that our world is equally as troubled and as uncertain. Uh, but do we have the 
concern for the evangelization of the world that our predecessors had. Uh, and that is a, a general challenge for all of us. So let's think about this nobler vision that Christians can have today regarding helping Jewish people encounter Jesus in a redemptive way. Because to do this, we really do need to have a nobler vision that's unfettered by the social and political chaos that swirls around us, that threatens to sweep us away from our own kingdom commitment. We become concerned about all sorts of other uh, contemporary issues. We forget our core responsibility, which is to the kingdom of God and its extension in this fallen world. We have to work towards this nobler vision by not forgetting the Jewish people to start with. There are much larger people groups to be concerned with in mission. There are more significant numbers of people professing faith in other contexts to excite us. There are more pressing local challenges, urban decay, drug, gangs, knife problems, unemployment, post-Christian Britain to concern and keep us busy, not only in, 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 in ministry, but also in our prayer time. Why bother remembering the Jewish people? Do we even have the time to be bothered to remember the Jewish people? Why should we have this nobler uh, interest? After the Holocaust, some people might say, how dare you even think about proselytizing Jewish people? They're hard-hearted, others would say. Why waste your time? Why don't you go to people that are more fruitful, people that are more likely to believe in Jesus? Why, why pick something that's, that's, that's so difficult? And then we're also less comfortable in evangelizing people who are perceived to be more successful in life than we are. The presumption is that mission is really for those that are poorer than us that we have got everything sorted out, go to people that haven't, and the kind of white savior complex that that uh, has brought to justifiable uh, criticism for. Uh, because mission isn't just for the poor. Jesus came for the tax collectors as well. Some of the apostles were small business owners. This isn't about economics or social standing. We fail to sufficiently affirm the universality of the gospel if we imagine that mission is only for those in underprivileged settings, taken to them by people from more privileged settings. Therefore, it seems to me that all of these reasons, Jewish mission is seen as less urgent, less motivating, less fruitful, less exciting, and less relevant uh, than other fields of service, and of which there are many, many fields. I've occasionally had people tell me that the Jewish people are no longer special. They are like everybody else. And if I may quote a very profound theological statement from The Incredibles, the 2004 children's animation, it will help us. Everyone is special, which is another way of saying no one is. Herman Bavink, the great uh, uh, missiologist, um, expressed a similar sentiment. Um, of uh, when people say Jews are no longer special, which reality has the de facto result of making Christians feel that they're of absolutely no significance at all. Herman Bavink, in his introduction to the science of mission, says, in addition to mission to other nations, missions to Israel demands our full attention. Israel has no priority, no preference, but it must not be forgotten. However, the reality of this sentiment as expressed by Bavink is that now they are no longer considered special by many Christians, they are now not even the same as everyone else. They become less than everyone else and not just deprioritized in missionary interest, but simply forgotten or avoided and have become the great omission in the Great Commission. And that really cannot stand for anybody who has the audacity to call themselves Bible-believing Christian. Hence, Bavink's insistence that missionary work to the Jewish people, as he called it, Israel, must not be forgotten. He has to say that to balance off his fact that he says that they're not special and there's no, there's no priority. He has to remind people they can't be forgotten because the, the tendency of, of his position is that it will be because they're not important. 
You know, you imagine a politician, and one just recently has come to mind. They have all of the privilege and all of the benefit of being a member of parliament, standing in the public eye, having all of the benefits and all of the honour and respect of being a, an elected member of, of, our, of our ruling House of Parliament, and suddenly they take a fall, whether it's moral, financial, or whatever it might be. They have to step down from the Houses of Parliament. They're no longer special. Are they the same as everybody else? Are they the same as the voters? No, they're less, because they were once special, but now they're not, which means they're not the same as everyone else. They're less than everybody else. And so the reality is the minute that we say the Jews are no longer special, we cannot be saying they're the same as everybody else. We are in fact saying they're less than everybody else. And the reality on the ground is that that affects mission commitment to the Jewish people. And you can theoretically say as long as you want, well, I really believe Jewish people still need to hear about the gospel, but do nothing about it, not even pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. And so Bavink goes on and he continues to plead, the only proper attitude for us is to wait with reverence and humility to see what God is going to do in this perplexing moment of history. And Bavink wrote that in the 1960s. And we've waited since Bavink wrote these words and bear witness to the increased numbers of Jewish people being added to the body of Christ. Now in CWI alone, these last three years, we have seen the number of Jewish people making professions of faith in Jesus and being baptized and coming into local congregations. The number that we've seen in the last three years reflected what it would previously have taken over a hundred years of missionary labor to see take place. Now that is quite remarkable. You need to allow that to, that to settle in a little bit. These last three years, we've seen the fruit that it would have taken a hundred years or more previously uh, to see come in. And that's really the encouragement that uh, I was sharing earlier on. The Israel College of the Bible, which is a, a Bible college in Israel, just uh, north of Tel Aviv, they, they had a, a recent uh, study that put the number of Jewish believers in Israel at an estimated 30,000, which I think is almost certainly a, a high side exaggeration. Um, but they based it on, on, on trends and, and numbers that, they, that they'd known previously. Because in, in, in 2017, there were 300 congregations that were counted in, in the state of Israel. That's communities of Jewish people meeting together regularly to worship Jesus as their Messiah. We'd call them church. In Israel, of course, church represents people that persecuted them. So they call themselves congregations or other such things. Um, of course, in Hebrew, uh, it would be called something completely different as well. In 1999, the number of Jewish believers was calculated through uh, a very in-depth survey that was done in, in the existing congregations by the Kaspari Center in Jerusalem. And the number of believers in Israel in 1999 was 5,000 following this, uh, this survey. Now, the Kaspari Center are in the process of revisiting this survey to try and find current figures. And they're nearly halfway through updating their data. And already the results have shown a doubling or even tripling of that number today. Now, there are many uh, of the people that they previously interviewed that won't take part in this survey, not because they're being unhelpful, but because the last one became a public book. The professional anti-missionary organizations in Israel use that data to try and get people thrown out of the country, have their citizenship revoked, because they were sharing that they'd become a believer in Jesus before they emigrated to Israel. And that would invalidate some, some people from uh, claiming the right to return to Israel as somebody who's born Jewish because according to rabbinic law, halakha it's called, which means uh, how you walk. Um, this religious law states that if you believe in Jesus, you're not Jewish anymore. And so that would impact their right to uh, make aliyah, to go up to immigrate to, to Israel. So there are quite a lot of people who are not getting involved. But despite that, there are still uh, Halfway through this updating of their statistical data, there's a doubling or trebling of that, of that 5,000 figure. And that would be you know, a, a, a very certain baseline um, figure. In 2019, 5,000 Jewish believers in Jesus is the number of just the Russian-speaking community in Israel. You've got the English speakers, you've got the Hebrew speakers, you've got the Amharic speakers, you've got the French speakers. So just the Russian-speaking congregations are 5,000. So it really is quite 
encouraging. Bear in mind a wider context, that in 1948, when the, when the State of Israel was, 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 was founded, there were only 23 Jewish people who named the name of Jesus as their Saviour and Lord. They all knew each other, and they could all fit in a room much smaller than this. And now there, there isn't uh, many buildings that could, uh, or, or, or stadia that could contain the, the number of Jewish believers in Jesus living in the state of Israel today. Safe to say that we are living in times uh, that we've not seen that number of Jewish believers in Jesus since the time of the Acts of the Apostles. And that is something to be really encouraged about. Now, it's also true that many people avoid Jewish mission because of the cross currents of craziness and rancor in the debate surrounding the end times and also uh, contemporary Middle Eastern politics. But to what extent is avoiding Jewish people in global mission just the world getting in the church? Once again, the world is imposing its agenda, its mores, its values upon God's church. Do you know that we even have churches that refuse to have our missionaries for deputation meetings simply because we've got the name Israel in our title? Can you believe that? You asked Philip, he made a phone call to try and uh, secure some uh, deputation meetings for one of his missionary colleagues and received quite a, quite a rude and obscene reply from a minister of a church precisely because we have Israel in our title. And so we get, we get trapped in, in some of the, the heat of uh, the political and eschatological debates that aren't often edifying. And the Jewish people are, are, are not valued for their own reasons. You know, people are interested in them because of politics, because of eschatology, because of speculation. We want to have Christians concerned for Jewish people for their own soul's sake. And that's our focus and our interest and our heart and the heart that we would like to engender within your own uh, internal missionary concern for the world. So mission to the Jewish people ought to be soteriologic, soteriologically driven rather than eschatological, eschatologically driven. In other words, it's not so much about when God will save the Jewish people uh, or, or in a way that's not yet experienced, but is hinted at in Romans chapter 10, verse 26. But how God saves through the declaration of the exclusive atoning work of their promised Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Because how shall they hear unless someone is sent to preach to them, as we read in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. And of course, the immediate context of this is the gospel to the Jewish people. And Romans is dealing with that great issue, particularly that 9, 10, and 11 section of, well, if, 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 if Jesus really is who he says he is and the gospel really is so wonderful, how come the Jewish people aren't believing in him? You know, is God impotent? You know, can he not keep his promises? And Paul, of course, sets out this incredible response to that about God's faithfulness and his sovereignty and salvation, his plans for the Jewish people. And how can they hear? unless somebody is sent to them. Now, these verses are used and adapted and applied to all sorts of ministry uh, scenes, and, 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 and rightly so, but the immediate context is the gospel going out to the Jewish people, which is easily forgotten. Um, so this section about the e efficacy of the gospel to the Jewish people is really important. And it's interesting to note in this verse that the proactive need that there is to actually send someone to preach to them. And this is what CWI is all about. Sending people to preach the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, to his own people according to the flesh. So let's consider some of the biblical principles, theological principles that fired this nobler vision that inspired so much prayer in Scotland 177 years ago and continues to drive the vision that we have today in CWI. Now the first thing that I would like to say to you is almost probably it's a kind of a duh moment, of course. Of course it is. It's the Great Commission. But, you know, it's so obvious that sometimes we miss its application to Jewish mission as well. Matthew 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, Bavink again says, mission, missions are not a response to an invitation, but they go forth in obedience to the command of Christ. It is a command. It's not an option for us. And therefore, mission to the Jewish people is not an option for Christians. It's not an option for God's church. It's a command. It's tied up in the obligatory Great Commission. 
It isn't something that we can just, well, we're, we're more interested in other people groups. You know, we don't want to take political sides. We're more interested in the Arabs. You know, we, there isn't. We can't take sides. The gospel is for the whole world. We can't be partisan. The gospel has no political bias or agenda. It is for everyone. And Jewish people are not excluded from the Great Commission. And so this is the general foundation to motivate our reaching out to Jewish people with the redemptive message of Jesus' atoning work. However, this often may only be a theoretical affirmation by many Christians, with sadly very little practical outworking of this sentiment. And so my experience is there are many, many evangelicals that will affirm this quite positively, particularly about the Jewish people, and then do absolutely nothing about it. The second point uh, that would drive our nobler vision is also probably another moment that's, uh, that's uh, I think, well, that's obvious as well. But again, it's obvious, so obvious that we forget its application again to the Jewish people. And that's Acts 1 verse 18. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in, Ju in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the gospel is for Jerusalem and Judea still. We're not stuck at the ends of the earth. Do we think that somehow... We're just at the ends of the earth now and nothing else matters. There's no sequence in this. The verse doesn't justify a time sequence that says once Jerusalem and Judea have had their turn, now all that's left for the church to do now is at, the, is at the ends of the earth. You know, this verse is occasionally coupled with the famous time when Paul in Acts 14, verse 47, declared that he was going to go to the Gentiles. And there's this faulty pairing based on a eisegetical presumption that Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth cannot exist at the same time. And that's easy to see why, why people do this, because, you know, the, 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 ne the next verse says that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So, you know, you can, you can, it's kind of, I can see how it happened. However, the very next place that we read that Paul and Barnabas go to is Iconium where we read in Acts 14 verse 1, now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Well, didn't he just say previously that he was going to the Gentiles? That's just a local thing. His practice always was to the Jew first. And here's the great apostle to the Gentiles. The apostle to the Gentiles was doing more Jewish evangelism than Peter, who was supposed to be the, the apostle to the Jewish people. What does that say to you? says a lot to me but here here he is back in back in the synagogue so we, we it's it's unsustainable to say that when Paul says that he will go to the Gentiles that was a, a general statement for all times that was just that one local position they didn't want him he moved on went to the next place went in the synagogue he had Jewish people respond he had gentle people respond. he had Jewish people oppose he also had Gentiles oppose him so having said that, the, that he turns to the Gentile and shakes the dust from off them, they're back at the synagogue in the next town because this was Paul's settled ministry, missionary practice to the Jew first. It wasn't just a theory. It, wasn't just a, it just wasn't a catchphrase. He actually did that. That was his, his, his missionary pattern. And it was successful because both Jews and Gentiles responded in faith as we see in Acts 14 verse 5, the opposition didn't just come from Jewish people, it also came from Gentiles as well. Arthur Glasser, who is a, a, a Jewish Christian academic in America, he wrote, the Christian mission to the Jewish people is unique. It is especially so when encountering the realities of witnessing to Jews contrasted with all other frontier, frontier crossing mission encounters in the world today. Judaism and Christianity are crowded with commonalities which paradoxically creates complicated, which paradoxically greatly complicates the mission task. And Paul realized there was so much uh, commonality that going to the synagogue was a, a, a practical strategy. He knew that there was so much that the Jewish people would understand. He could preach to them about atonement, the things that we heard Philip talking about this morning, about sacrifice for sin. I mean, you go to many of Britain's high streets and talk to people about sin, they might think it's a new nightclub that's opened in the town. Uh, but with, with, the, with the Jewish people, there's so much that he could assume. He didn't have to start from nowhere. It wasn't a completely non-church 
environment, and so it was, a, it was a strategically important in, his, in this missionary strategy. He found the people that he had the most in common with, that had the most uh, existing knowledge. How can you say that Jesus is the answer when you weren't preaching to the, any of the people that had the original question? And so we see this with, with Paul and then how that successfully transfers to the gospel being taken to all the nations of the world. But then let's just think about uh, Paul's statement to the Jew first. Because the gospel still is to the Jew first and also for the Greek. And however you want to interpret that verse, and there are many different ways people do, it still boils down to the truth that Romans 1 verse 16 reinforces the reality that we cannot skip over the Jewish people and uh, go to the, the people, uh, the easier people groups, the larger people groups with the gospel, the more fruitful mission fields, or just stick with the people that look like us and speak like us, that have our accent and, and our life experience and, and our same colour. I once heard a, a sermon on Romans 1 verse 16 that managed to avoid the second part of that verse altogether. They didn't even read the full scripture in the, in the, in the, in the Bible reading before, before the sermon. And I was quite frustrated by that. I wrote my own version of the verse as a parody to reflect this kind of practice that seems to be quite common. And this is what I wrote. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ or even the rest of this verse. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And if we want to preach the whole counsel of God, we can't avoid that. We re and we shouldn't avoid that. Can we preach the whole counsel of God if we avoid the second part of this verse? Because all scripture is God-breathed. However, when to the Jew first is omitted, uh, uh, omitted in our preaching on, on Romans 1 16 and for whatever the reason might be maybe not thinking it's the most relevant part of the of the of the chapter for the inner city congregation and there's people struggling with alcoholism and there's people struggling with drugs and their children struggling with gender identity it's not necessarily the first thing that springs to mind that's the most essential thing to communicate in that sermon uh, but I, I you know to not even read it I think is it's just emblematic of a, of a deeper problem that I feel is, uh, is, is, is prevalent in, in, in many people's hearts and minds. Um, and so, because it's not the most relevant thing, the congregations don't tend to hear it. It's, it easily has the effect of causing a congregation to adopt to the Jew last, and then eventually to the Jew not at all position, whether that is consciously or subconsciously what is done. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like if the second part of Romans 1 verse 16 wasn't even in the Bible? What a struggle it would be. God put Romans 1 verse 16 in its entirety in the Bible because without it, the church would find it even easier to duck out of the hard task of reaching Jewish people with, with, with Jesus. And we would. It's not an easy task to do. The next thing I'd like to think about in terms of helping us create a nobler vision that drives our reaching out to Jewish people with the message of Jesus. And it's that time when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, that really poignant image where he stands and he sees that city that has killed the previous prophets, that has so much drama, and he sees with the eyes of, uh, of his divinity, past, present, and future, all that has, all that will befall, that city, he feels its pain and its anguish, and he weeps. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, that, and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you were not willing. See, your house is left desolate to you. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If we cultivate the heart of Christ, part of being Christ-like surely must be the ability to still weep over Jerusalem. If you cannot weep over Jerusalem, over the tragedy of Israel still in their unbelief, there is an element of Christ that you haven't quite yet cultivated in your own heart. If we want to be like Jesus, 
we must have a deep compassion and concern for his own people, of his own flesh, of the Jewish people. Yet so often, rather than stand with Jesus and weep over Jerusalem, we mistakenly think the correct paradigm for us is to stand next to Jesus, pointing the accusing finger as he delivers the woes to the Pharisees. Whereas we should be sat with the Pharisees, receiving our master's healing rebuke. We have no right to stand with Jesus and point that particular finger anywhere other than to our own hearts. And believe me, it is for your spiritual health and well-being, spiritual maturity, that we receive that particular series of rebukes from our Lord. But if we can then realize that rather than stand with the judging finger, think of the Jewish people of the Pharisees, and stand with Jesus looking at Jerusalem and weeping and yearning for the lost, we will then have the purest motive for engaging the Jewish people with the gospel of their promised Messiah. Can you weep over Jerusalem? If you can't yet, then it's a spiritual exercise uh, for you to, to embark upon. The next thing I'd, I'd like us to think about in, in, in trying to construct a nobler vision to, to give us the biblical and theological motivation to reach the Jewish people is the Apostle Paul's example. And the Apostle Paul's heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel was that they might be saved. He emulated the heart of Jesus that we just talked about. And he had that heart for his own kinsmen as well. In Romans 10, verse 1, that verse I just quoted to you. There are two aspects of note here. Firstly, Paul was motivated. It was his heart's desire. He was emotionally engaged. He cared about them. He was able to stand with Jesus and weep. If you cannot stand with Jesus and look at Jerusalem and weep over the Jewish people, you're not motivated. You might have all the theory, yeah, yeah, it's for the Jews, yeah, the Great Commission, Jerusalem, Judea, the ends of the earth. You just tick box your theological statement. God wants to engage your heart. He wants you to weep over Jerusalem. He wants you to care. And it was Paul's heart's desire that drove him to prayer for his people that they might be saved. Have you ever tried playing, praying for something you didn't really care about? What kind of prayer is that? You tell me. It's not the most authentic and driven. Yes, God hears all of our prayers in all of our brokenness, in all our frailty, because we have a high priest that, 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 that translates our broken and heartless and uh, mixed motive uh, service and, and messages to God, and he accepts it because it's a, free, it's a sweet fragrance because of Christ. But surely we should attain to something a bit better. Surely we should attain to it being our heart's desire, as well as our prayer, as well as just our tick boxing. Yes, yeah, the Jews need Jesus as well. It should matter to us. I think that we really need to cultivate, to use old language, a passion for souls, to really care about the Jewish people, that they would be saved. And it was Paul's emotional engagement that drove him to pray to God. And the content of his prayer was for his people, the Israelites, the Jewish people, to be saved. I'd like to quote a very, very esteemed Scottish theologian, David Torrance. He wrote this. Paul had a deep longing for Israel to come to faith in Christ and prayed earnestly that they might be saved. This needs to be emphasized today. This is more important because many Christians, both evangelicals and liberals, persuaded that Israel continues to be the covenant people of God and is being used by God in his purposes of salvation, have come to the conclusion that the church and Israel must, as it were, go on in parallel in history, acknowledging one another, acknowledging that both are being used in the purposes of God, but not seeking to influence one another for, for or against Christ. Not until such a time that God, on his own initiative, reveals himself to the Jews as the Messiah, as Paul on the Damascus Road and all Israel will be saved. This, however, is surely contrary to the whole spirit and teaching of the New Testament. The Christian gospel was born within Judaism, even in the context of Judaism. He insists that there must be no lessening of emphasis on Christ Jesus, in who alone there is salvation. 
And if we have this heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that will drive our evangelistic engagement, our, our prayer for our salvation. We can respect Jewish people, we can appreciate Judaism, we can gain great insights, but we know that all human philosophy and all religions are insufficient because there is only one who saves. It doesn't mean that we have to be disrespectful or, 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 or feel superior to other cultures and religions and, and ideologies and non-ideologies. Um, but we cannot avoid the fact that there is only one alone in whom there is salvation. And if we have that heart's desire that is modelled on Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, there won't be a sense of arrogance and superiority as we share the love of Christ with other people. The next point I'd like to share with you as we try to create the nobler vision to, to motivate us in the gospel to the Jewish people is this. If Jesus is not for Jewish people, how on earth can he be for anybody else? The integrity of the gospel message to the whole world is still contingent on it being a message that is vital and relevant for Jewish people to hear today and to respond in faith. How can Jesus Christ be for the nations if he is not still the Messiah of Israel, fulfilling all of the hopes and the prophecies of the Jewish scriptures? How can Jesus be for everybody else but the Jewish people today and the Bible still have any integrity as a historical document? David Hesselgrave wrote in his book Communicating Christ Cross-Culturally, Christianity is the fulfillment of the aspirations of most of the non-Christian religions, but it is the fulfillment of the revelation of only one other religion. And that religion is Judaism. Now, Jesus doesn't have to be English or Scottish or Welsh or any other nationality to be relevant to those different national groups. But it is only a Jewish Jesus who can be the saviour of the world. Because it is only this one Jewish man who was born of a virgin in Bethlehem Ephrata of the line of David, who that can be the promised Messiah of Israel, prophesied by the Hebrew prophets, who can therefore be the saviour of the whole world. You don't have to be Jewish to believe in Jesus, but Jesus has to be Jewish if believing in him has any redemptive worth at all. So if Jesus isn't for the Jewish people, he really can't be for any other people group in the world. And then finally, I'd like to think about this incredible challenge that is put in, in, in Romans 11 verse 14, where the Apostle Paul tells us what his strategy for us is, how we can successfully reach the Jewish people with the gospel. And he simply says that our role today is to provoke Israel to jealousy. How do we provoke Israel to jealousy? I have a good friend, he's a Jewish believer, he used to be one of our missionaries, Mark Surrer. He used to be the president of the Young Communist Party of Great Britain before he became a believer, an incredibly wonderful man. And uh, he often says that the church has more often provoked Israel and the Jewish people to fear and anger than it has done to jealousy. I remember uh, uh, Ray McCabe, who was a Free Church of Scotland missionary with us in CWI. I did my training 30 years ago with him in, in Glasgow. He used to always say, he goes, until the day comes when we arrive at church and there is a crowd of Jewish people across from our church looking at us enviously as we walk into our place of worship. We haven't even come close to fulfilling this challenge to provoke Israel to jealousy. And yet when Jewish people look at the church and our history and, uh, uh, and some of our behavior, I think jealousy is often quite a long way down the list of things that they feel. And yet the Apostle Paul tells us this should be right at the top, that we should provoke Israel to jealousy and all the things that we who are, who are not a people, if you're not Jewish here today, I'm assuming that none of you are, though in these days we can't assume. But, uh, you know, if you're not Jewish, you, you, you were once not a people, you are now a people. You were outside of the covenant and promises of God and you've been brought 
into those covenant promises now. We have a relationship with God that is vibrant and meaningful and sustaining and hopeful, an anchor that, that shores our soul in stormy waters. We should be provoking the Jewish people to jealousy. And so often that hasn't been the case. Al Mola wrote a, a, a little uh, booklet called Do the Jews Really Need Christ? Controversy over Jewish evangelism. In 2009, there was great controversy of the Southern Baptists had uh, written a document about the gospel still needing to preach to the Jewish people. And it was a huge hullabaloo about this kind of retrogressive, imperialistic uh, throwback to uh, missionary colonialism and uh, it wasn't respectful and it shouldn't happen. And um, it was quite something. And he wrote this, 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 this lovely booklet. He said this, the New Testament is unambiguous in its declaration that Jesus is the promised Messiah and that all those who are saved must enter through the narrow gate of belief in Jesus as the Christ. The Christian church owes a great debt to the Jewish people, God's chosen people. Most importantly, we owe them the gospel. I think that is really quite powerful. This summer we were in London, we had a uh, an outreach. We had uh, 40 people from 11 different countries join us to do two weeks of evangelism to the Jewish communities of, of, of London. And I met this uh, retired Israeli major in, in, in Leicester Square and uh, his, his partner got quite angry with me. Why are you bothering us Jewish people with Jesus and all of this talk about Jesus? I said, because you bothered us with him first, I'm just bringing it back. <laughs> and that really is what it is. You know, if all of the other motives don't capture your heart, let's just return the favor. How do you think that the rest of the world got the gospel? Who were the missionaries that brought the gospel to the rest of the world? Who were they? They weren't Eskimos, they weren't English, and they weren't Scottish, and they weren't Welsh, they weren't whatever country you're from either. You know, there were Jewish people who were willing to step outside the bounds of what they knew, outside of the bounds of what they loved, away from the people that they cared about. They had a greater vision for the evangelization of the world. And they had a greater confidence in the gospel that it could be meaningful to all of the world, to people that they'd never seen before, people that they couldn't imagine could look as different as they did from them. They had a holy vision for the whole of God's created order. Reverend John Domlop, who was uh, one of our CEOs way back when, wrote a, 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 a book in 1842 called Memoirs of Gospel Triumphs Among the Jews During the Victoria Era. And it was a jubilee celebration of, uh, of the British Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Among the Jews, which is one of our previous names, CWI. And he wrote this, So Christian workers among the Jews ever give and gain. Their work is never in vain. Every Christian worker should be encouraged by the absolute certainty of ultimate success. The divine ordainment in the physical domain that no force once exerted is ever lost is equally true in the spiritual realm with this important difference, that the energy expended for the present and permanent well-being of the Jews and Gentiles is transformed into service rendered unto him who died for us and who shall be and by say to us, inasmuch as ye did it to the least of one of these my brethren, you did it unto me. If we have a concern for the salvation of the Jewish people, it's the least of Jesus' brethren, and we do it unto him. These, I would like to suggest to you this morning, are the nobler biblical and theological principles that can drive us onto a more faithful, compassionate, biblical, and Christ-like gospel engagement with Jewish people today. And I hope there's been some stimulation and, and help for you this morning. Thank you. Can we just stay up here? Dear Richard. Uh, Richard, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, we have just a few minutes available if anyone has any questions. So please, uh, if you would like to ask Richard, I'll let you um, okay, point folks sure. out as you see them. Yeah. So please, anyone want to ask anything? 
Either that was exhaustive or exhausting. <laughs> I, I have a little list, but I'm going to list. Yes. Is uh, CWI mainly for London? No. No, we were in international missions, so in the last uh, five years we started a new work in Amsterdam, in Paris. Uh, we've restarted our work in Australia, we started a new work in America, in Pittsburgh, we've started a new work in Tel Aviv, a uh, new work in Jerusalem. We have uh, um, a new missionary candidate from Korea who we're waiting to see if we can get him into London. We have a missionary f that we've appointed in Taiwan who we're hoping to get to, uh, to join a, a team we're building in Australia. So we've always, uh, as, well CWI became CWI in 1976, two missions amalgamated. Um, and uh, since, uh, since that we've, we had quite an expansive international work and in World War II all of our, we had to rescue our missionaries from, from Nazi Europe because the, the SS were hunting them down. We had a lot of Jewish believers who were missionaries. Um, and so we lost a lot of property and the Nazis uh, took a lot from us. And so we're now trying to reinvest back into parts of Europe that the Nazis took away from us. I find it really exciting that we're able to do that. Amsterdam and Paris in particular. Yeah. Yes. Certainly. Okay, so is, is mission to the Jewish people a priority above all others, or is it something that shouldn't be forgotten amongst all others? I would say um, that it's, it shouldn't be forgotten, but there is a sense that there's a priority because without it, everything else falls. If we haven't got anything for Jewish people, where's the integrity of the gospel? Where's the historical veracity of, of these scriptures that we're preaching? You know, how can they be a fulfillment for... For, for people in, in Boston if it's not meaningful for Jewish people. So there's a priority in the sense of you know, this was the original context that it happened and therefore there's a, a kind of a theological imperative of it still being uh, significant. Are Jewish people more important than others for the gospel? No, they're, we're all created in God's image and likeness um, and the gospel is equally to go out to all others. But it's like uh, parents with children, you know, you don't want to have favourites, you need to love them all. And if you have a favourite, there's something wrong with you, <laughs> even though you might st still have. And many of us have our kind of things that our hearts are more drawn to than others. Um, but despite how we're drawn to other missions, you know, if, you're, if you're, your calling is to, you know, urban youth in Glasgow, you're still called to the Jewish people because it's the historical context on what everything else is founded. Okay? Thanks. Yes, at the back. Um, Okay, so the question is about um, should we just live our lives and then people notice by us being different that we should provoke people to jealousy. So is what I'm saying about provoking Israel to jealousy the same as what's said about other people? We just, a lifestyle evangelism with no declarative uh, aspect. Uh, no. <laughs> my, my father told me a story about a man who <laughs> worked for 40 years in a factory and he believed that his life, should li his life would speak for Jesus. And he'd live such a different life, people would come to him and then he'd tell them the gospel. Of course, 40 years later, and his retirement due, nobody had ever asked him, you know, anything. And he was crestfallen because he believed, I'm going to live a really great life and everybody's going to ask and I'll share the gospel and my colleagues will get saved. And um, as he's walking the door, out of the door from his retirement due, somebody goes, hey Bob, hop, hold on, hop a second. I want to ask you something. It's been bothering me for years and years and years. And Bob's thinking, yes, this is the moment. He says, Bob, I've noticed you're different. Are you a vegetarian? <laughs> we need to declare. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. How shall they hear unless they're sent? And so, yes, but the, the two, they've got to be together, haven't they? But it can't, one can't be without the other. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much.